Hi, everyone. Welcome to Bricks and Clicks, hybrid models for the art market. It's the first entry in Art Basel's OVR Miami Beach Conversations program curated by Ken Winkleman. I'm Tim Schneider, the art business editor at Artnet News and your moderator for the next hour. We're going to introduce our three panelists in just a few moments, but first, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Number one, we are aiming for the actual panel discussion to last 45 minutes, and then that will give us 15 minutes at the end where we can turn it over to the audience to ask questions, which leads us to how do you do that? The answer is if you look at the bottom of your Zoom window, there's an icon down there that says Q&A. If you click that, then you can just type whatever your question is into the box. and we'll be able to look at it near the end. We'll also say you can put your questions in there at any point. You don't have to wait until the end of the conversation. So if something comes up 20 minutes in that sparks something in your mind, go ahead and punch in your question then. And I will just look at it once we get to the 45 minute mark. And on cue, someone just showed up to my door. Live TV, everybody, you gotta love it. Okay, <laughs> so uh, last point, we have live closed captioning that's available also. So if you, again, look at the bottom of your Zoom window, there is a button that says CC live transcript, hit that, and at that point, you'll be seeing everything in closed caption. Okay, with all of that said, just to set the stage a little bit, obviously the pandemic has made this a chaotic year in all kinds of different ways. And it has forced the art business to adapt rapidly and repeatedly to circumstances that change from week to week and from place to place. And now we got through this period where in the early months, in the original shutdowns, everybody was forced to go online to an unprecedented degree. And that meant collectors, it meant dealers, it meant art fairs, it meant artists. And we're now at this stage where thankfully we can start to have in-person art experiences again, in some form at least. And so what we're going to do in this conversation is that we're going to explore some firsthand insights for managing this hybrid bricks and clicks online offline approach during COVID and then what elements of it might outlast the pandemic and help us make the art world work a little bit better for the long term. So to provide those firsthand insights, we are very fortunate to be joined by three fantastic panelists. First up, Agustina Ferreira, who is the founder and director of Galleria Agustina Ferreira in Mexico City. Daniela Gara, who is the global board director for White Q. And last but certainly not least, Dennis Scholl, who is a longtime Miami Beach collector and also the president and CEO of the nonprofit Ulight Arts. So thanks to the three of you for joining us and for putting up with me this week. I wanna start here just to sort of establish the, the stakes a little bit. So obviously this is not the Miami Art Week that any of us planned we were going to have at the beginning of this year. And so I'm just curious to know what you would have originally planned to do this week and instead what you're doing now based on the circumstances. And Dennis, since you are the only one of us who is physically in Miami Beach right now, I would love to start with you. Hell of a lot less air kissing, that's for sure. <laughs> you know, that, that peck on the left, peck on the right. If you're from Brussels, you get three, or Switzerland, you get three. Not doing any of that. Um, and of course, yesterday was would have been the 20th anniversary of us uh, bringing down a curator from somewhere in the world to install the art in our home from our collection, which we basically just give them the keys to the storage, give them the keys to the empty home, and walk away and we come back and it's all done. And we would normally have anywhere from a thousand to 1500 people come through our home. Instead yesterday, I did a Zoom call and I talked about the collection, just me talking by myself for 40 minutes. 
not quite as fun. Um, and it's quiet down here. There is a little activity. There are things going on. There's some wonderful galleries that have come to South Florida, Daniela included. Um, and, um, but it's, it's clearly different and, you know, and, and they've done pop-ups in various places. Uh, so I would be having a lot more fun and acting as the concierge to about 30,000 of my closest friends with that, Tim, I'll hand it back to you. Okay, great. Well, since you mentioned Daniela, who was also in Florida, let's just move it over that way. Daniela, what have you been up to this week? Hello, all greetings from West Palm. Um, so some, obviously the, the fact that we're not doing the fair is the biggest difference, but what's not too different is the fact that we are doing an offsite project. So for the last sort of six years of Art Basel Miami, um, working with, with Craig Robbins and his team, we've been able to do three projects over the last six years um, alongside the art fair, which has always been incredibly fun for us and exciting. And we get to be part of, the commun of a community that we wouldn't otherwise be able to be a part of. So we're trying to continue that. And this year we decided to do something um, in West Palm Beach, which opens next week. So something maybe similar along the lines. I would say that one of the things that not having a physical fair and only having the online offers as well is an opportunity for more, um, you know, for uh, virtual personal tours that otherwise might not happen. So yesterday, my colleague, Matthew Tari, he did a walkthrough because we've got all the Art Basel Miami works installed in our viewing rooms in London. And he did a wonderful tour on VIP day within the first hour, which was really exciting to see. Made it all come alive, I hope, for everybody. Um, and also there was a, uh, we hosted a talk with Michael Craig Martin and John Good talking about the um, work from the 1960s by Al Held that we have up in London. So it's stuff like that that we were able to do that we wouldn't have otherwise been able to. Uh, and Agustina, what's uh, what's happening in Mexico City? Well, I mean, it's definitely what's different is like you both said, we're not there and we're not doing the regular Miami thing, which to me, it's very important because you get to see art and you get to, to talk uh, physically with clients that you don't necessarily see uh, year long, but also colleagues. It's to me, it's very important to share with my colleagues and fairs are definitely a place to do so. Having said that though, um, this year in Mexico City, uh, the 10 galleries that participate uh, from our boss in Miami, uh, we decided to come together and do a physical version of our of the fair at a house that we rented in Colonia Juarez. And it has been a wonderful experience because we get to show a selection of our OVRs in a physical environment and have like a, a semi-physical art fair. And it has been wonderful. The response has been great. Of course, with all the protocols that we have to have for COVID and social distancing and having a mask all, all the time, which makes it a bit clumsy, but it has been wonderful. And so in that sense, I don't feel I'm missing out so much and I get to um, share uh, art in person. Uh, I feel a little out of shape, I have to say, but it has been great. Well, let's, uh, th this raises an interesting question because the word unprecedented has been thrown around more than probably any other word this year. But I feel like there are things that the art world has been through that did actually prepare us in some sense for what we are now dealing with. And I guess, you know, not to put you back on the spot immediately, but earlier this week, we were talking about some of the earlier initiatives that you've been a part of before COVID. And I was wondering if you could maybe clue us in on what some of those were and how they prepared you for what we're now going through. Well, yeah, I mean, when I was going over the questions, I mean, I did, we did talk about this. I think that uh, maybe it's a generational thing, but I think um, we, uh, my generation and specifically me, uh, not specifically, but me as an example, I have been involved in many initiatives uh, that are of a collaborative nature in the past, uh, whether it's Condo, which is a collaborative uh, exhibition gallery exchange initiated by 
Vanessa Carlos from Carlos Ishikawa in London, or uh, Roberta, which is another uh, collaborative uh, exhibition structure that I did with some colleagues, all Latin American in 2017 to kind of like um, have a physical presence in Los Angeles during the Pacific Standard Time and all these major exhibitions that were happening at the time. Um, and, and many others like that. To me, it's kind of a, it's part of what the world is right now. I mean, I think we have, we have to come together and find these things. Um, whether it is because we're trying to escape the fair circuit or off or have a more international presence without doing all the fairs, uh, or because you just uh, come together with colleagues with whom you share uh, a similar uh, program or world vision and you are just friends and you start doing these types of exchange that allow you to uh, reach more people and more places. So in that sense, I think that my whole gallery is, uh, history or career has been uh, of the in in this uh, sense collaborate and and I wouldn't say impressive. I mean, of course, COVID has been world changing for everybody on every level, but it's not so strange to me. And as you can see right now, I don't live in Mexico City, and I'm here and I'm doing this uh, Casa Versalles. Um, exhibition so i think it's great and and i think this might be the future you know we we might have to start thinking about um this local and collaborative solutions uh because i don't i don't think it's going to be um that quick that we're going to jump back into the traditional regular art fair circuit so yeah right right and now, Daniela, obviously, White Cube has a whole different set of resources than a smaller gallery. And we tend to hear about these collaborative efforts being something that, that smaller galleries are doing just to try to pool resources and all that kind of stuff. I'm just wondering, not necessarily if you were doing anything specifically the same as what Agustina was just talking about with these types of collaborative um, initiatives. But do you have anything that was in the mix before this that really kind of set you up, you felt, to, to really not have to start from zero? Mm. Um, I think, well, just immediately in terms of, I think whether you're a gallery with resources or not, camaraderie and speaking to your colleagues is really important. And I remember <clears throat> as soon as lockdown hit in London, which is where I'm based, um, you know, Sadie Coles immediately started a group, a London group gallery WhatsApp, which was fantastic. And what are the new rules and how are you handling staff regulations? And so, and that gallery WhatsApp grew from, I think it was about, started at 15 people and ended up being 50 people. And every single thing that affects the galleries in, in London was on this fantastic sort of group, group chat. And it was really, really, really helpful. So, I think just that on that level is really important. Um, other ways we're connecting is it's fantastic to be down here with a group of, you know, incredible colleagues, um, you know, from, from, from New York, from wherever. I know there's a few that may be coming from other parts of the world yet to come down here. So it's really nice to feel part of that sort of critical mass of exceptional galleries and exceptional programs. So that's really important, I think, regardless of resource. Um, what set us up? I think, I think the, as a global gallery with a gallery in Hong Kong, two in London, an office in New York, and, a, and a, um, beautiful viewing rooms in Paris, um, we have different things, different exhibitions going on at different times. Um, but we always have to be able to communicate with the people who are not able to physically see the works and experience the works. So I think what COVID did for us was basically precipitate our investigation of technology. So we were sending out PDFs, we had a certain type of OVR, um, but we really had to sort of get on our game and figure out a way where we can have communication, have dialogue and create a meaningful engagement with the exhibitions and the works. And so that we had to move really, really fast um, to do. Um, and then we also started an online exhibition program, which we, 
I don't know if we would have done that or not, but that's been really exciting because um, I think we've done 11, 11 online exhibitions, no, six online exhibitions, but one of them was during the summer when the, um, the art students, they, which would normally happen in July, they couldn't have their degree shows because we were in lockdown, which, sorry, in May. And so with the curatorial team went through all their all submitted portfolios and we did um, four exhibitions of five artists each and the graduates were able to present their degree shows, which was a great exposure, obviously no sales and anyone who wanted to buy anything went, went back to the artists. So we engaged regionally, locally, but we're able to reach a super wide audience through this new platform, which wouldn't have happened if, if COVID hadn't hit us. Right, and Daniela, you just, obviously you mentioned PDFs and OVRs and Dennis, you're on the receiving end of that entire aspect of the business in Good Friday. <laughs> Avalanche. <laughs> okay, so, so yeah, I, I'd be curious to hear, can you talk a little bit about your experience with receiving all of that stuff. And because I've certainly heard in my reporting on this subject that a lot of collectors are feeling overwhelmed. They feel like there's just been too much coming at them digitally. And so where do you stand on that issue? Well, I mean, I think that the gallerists have uh, a duty to find a way to get us the information. And this is the current model. Um, I think that uh, a couple things are happening. Uh, number one, it's much more difficult to learn about a new artist this way. You can learn about new art from an artist whose work you already know. You know, if you've been collecting an artist for a while and they have a new show, you've already got a body of knowledge as a collector that you can take and, and use to say, you know, does this new show that I'm looking at online, I know how big approximately these are. I see that blue that he carried forward or that imagery that he carried forward or she carried forward. Um, so you have that. But if you're a new artist or a young artist, um, it's, it's much more difficult because it comes from the sky. There's no way to, uh, you know, maybe it's made all of us look a little more with our eyes instead of our ears, which is a nice thing, of course. That's a good thing because the art world, particularly the art world that we all operate in, sometimes the ears dominate over the eyes. And I don't really love that. But it is very, very difficult to uh, to look at new art. Um, the other thing that's happened, I think, is that um, we've all had a little bit more time, and that's allowed us to dig in a little more, and that's been fun. It's been fun to look at 40 auction catalogs a week as opposed to four, and it's been fun to look at 100 online viewing rooms as opposed to maybe five or 10. Um, you know, as a collector, that's just a kind of like candy. You just enjoy doing it. Um, so. So it, it, it has been heavy, but the thing about it is that, is that it's very easy to say no. And that's not typically how the art world works because if Daniela has something that she thinks is perfect for me and she sends it to me and says, Dennis, I'm gonna look. But if, but if a gallery just sends me their online viewing room as a mass emailing, that's a different story. So I think personalization is the key to getting through to the collectors right now. You've got to find a way to connect um, with your current relationships. You have to mine your current relationships because you know, those people are still involved and they're still in the art world and all that. So, uh, so I think personalization is a really big key to this, even though it's a very impersonal medium, you've still got to find a way to connect on a personal level. I also, before I give it back to you, I just wanna give a shout out. One of my favorite artists in the world is online. And uh, this is closed captions. So I just wanted to give a shout out to uh, Joseph Grigley, who I love as an artist dearly. So give it back to you. All right, that, way to just use the format to, to everyone's advantage, Dennis. I really appreciate that. <laughs> um, so I guess where I'd like to go with this next, um, Agustina, I mean, Dennis is talking about these uh, basically this, this sense of how much stuff is out there obviously. And is that something that you're factoring in when you try to figure out, like, do I need to do an online viewing room? Should I just blast out an email about a new show that I want to do? Like, how does the, how much are you thinking about what else is happening in terms of what the people that you're trying to get into a meaningful conversation with, 
are having to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in their inboxes? Well, this is something I've been thinking about for quite a while, even be way before the pandemic, because I thought there was a certain exhaustion from digital materials, even before COVID. Uh, we were basically either uh, asking collectors to take a look at a PDF or asking them to get on a plane and go see us at a fair. And so I, I was already thinking about this as a problem. Um, and I think that is still, uh, to me, I've been very sensitive about uh, these uh, times. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's this is a commercial business. So we have to keep it going, right? And so to me, it has been all about, as Dennis was mentioning, um, very personal relationships. I think I have been on the phone talking to people more than ever in my life. Um, and I don't like phone conversations that much. I'm a big texter and I do a lot of email, but phone to me is like emergency level. And this year I have been on the phone a lot with people and it has been wonderful actually. Uh, I, am, I, I have found a new place in my heart for co phone conversations again, because you, you don't only talk about art. It's not so uh, aggressive. You talk about family, you talk about feelings, you talk about politics, you make it personal. And I think in the end, that's what separates certain galleries from the rest of the pack. Like that's how you pers personalize it. Your, the experience is with your relationship. And that's a work that only you can do. Nothing, nobody can do it for you. No online viewing room would ever, ever um, be the same. You know, there's always, it's like calling customer service at an airline say, and talking to a robot is, you know, it's terrible. And it, you always feel more secure. I mean, in the end, and I think that we discussed this before, or I mentioned it to you in the original interview, um, trade, which is what we essentially do, it's about trust. And it's really hard to trust a stranger. And so in that sense, art fairs are great because you meet new people, but you need the physical experience. I mean, there's the handshake, the body language, the eyes, you know, all those indicators are major. But if you don't have that, you have to go back to the people that you do have and build on that trust and like build on the relationship. Uh, like any other relationship, they're like little plants and you have to water them, you have to take care of them. And so I think uh, to me, um, that has been the, the biggest and best thing about it. Um, yeah. And Daniela, what's, what's your perspective on this? I mean, how have you been trying to juggle that tension, I guess, between um, keeping in touch with people and also trying to meet new people when you're restricted physically in ways that you're not used to being? Okay. Um, well, that's the balance, isn't it? I remember in the beginning of when all this started and we had to figure out a way to keep our business going. You know, you would reach out and make a call to people that you know quite well, but you had to be really careful what was going on in their life. Was their son a doctor in an emergency room? Maybe their child, you know, in school. You didn't know what was happening in people's lives. And so I agree with Agustina, this wonderful sort of just human being to human being became the priority. And then once things settled in and you you knew how to approach someone and just see where they are and see what's going on and make sure everything was okay. I remember in the beginning, it was about just checking that everyone was okay. Are you okay? Where are you? Are you safe? That sort of thing. And then and then once you know that 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 um, everyone felt comfortable, then you could say, hey, you know, we're we're doing this or we're doing that, or I know you like this and let's talk about this. Um, but it is all about the personal, and that's where I think blicks, bricks and clicks, clicks and bricks comes in, because once we were able to start installing things in the gallery again, um, what I found the most satisfying and what I hope collectors like Dennis found the most satisfying was when we were able to literally walk through the show together or walk through the viewing room together. And, you know, can you go closer to this? Can you tell me about this? You know, it has to be about the people and it has to be about engagement. 
um, personal engagement with the person that's that's that you're talking to and then try and get as close to the art as you possibly can and I think that's the best way to do that having said that just on a more sort of broader perspective you know when we look at our offerings or our messagings or our you know exhibitions and art fairs and all the things that are going on in every gallery's life we definitely tier things we look and see not everything goes to everybody because that would be madness so you look at what's happening regionally where is that show you look at pricing levels you look at um interest levels in the artists you look and see what's happening in the museums when they're open again um we just had tracy emin open at the royal academy so there's you know linkage there to certain people so we do try and be as sensitive as we possibly can while still trying to let people know what's happening at white cube around the world um but we do dennis rest assured we don't want to blast everybody with everything all the time So can, can, I, can I add one more thing? Oh, please. Sorry. Um, you know, just to to uh, further emphasize what Daniela is saying, uh, I think not only personalization, which is uh, human relationships, but also I I think it's really good on the positive side how uh, this pandemic has made us really think about what digital content is and who is it oriented to. And in that sense, I think it has been wonderful to see how much uh, art has reached new people uh, and integrated other audiences, including people with disabilities of all sorts. Uh, yeah. Even like uh, psycho-emotional disabilities. There are people who can simply not go to an art fair because it's very crowded. They get very anxious. Um, you have uh, deaf people, blind people. So this is very important. And I think that this is, uh, you know, because art has always had that bad thing around it that it's so not for everybody, but we always want to say that it's for everybody. And it's the, and some of us work towards that, but in general, it is still a very exclusive kind of um, space. And, uh, and so I think this pandemic has really opened up the art world. And I think that's absolutely fabulous. And I hope that that is here to stay. Uh, and through that, you know, there's, there's always new people that comes through old people and new camaraderies. And I think that has been such a positive thing. And I, I hope, I really hope that that is here to stay. Uh, and then digital can become just another language that we have to integrate forever. Uh, beyond the pandemic and not as a response to crisis only but as as a new tool as something that we fully have to integrate i hope so right no i think that that's a great point i mean this is this is the uh thing you always hear well, politicians often say about crises is is that they uh they're, they have a silver lining because they give you opportunities to rethink things. And one of the elements that people have had to rethink is regionalization, localization. I mean, we've talked about the quote unquote global art world for so long that I feel like people have just sort of sunk into that idea that you have to be everywhere all the time. And the pandemic has obviously forced us back into more, a more local perspective on things. And I'm wondering if, if you think that that's one of the positives too, because it can help us make things more personal, maybe look immediately around us in ways that we hadn't. And Dennis, before we started the, uh, the actual panel, you were talking about how you feel like this year, there's been a much bigger focus on the artistic community in Miami Beach, and that that was a little bit of, of a difference from what we usually have during this time. Yeah, I, I oversee an art center, Oolite Arts, it, which basically just provides direct support to visual artists, including studios for two years at a time, uh, direct funding for their projects, et cetera. When COVID hit, we started a relief fund for artists, gave out money all, all over Miami-Dade County. And the fair has always been kind of a love-hate relationship uh, for the local artists, because in the beginning, the local artists didn't understand that the fair wasn't coming to promote their art specifically. Um, as time passed, they began to understand what the fair is, how it moves from place to place, 
how much how much money they could make in the gig economy by working for the fair at the fair for the galleries you know art art wrangling things like that and how around the margins a lot of people would come see their art and it's helped immensely the artists in our community even though we have very few artists in the in in the fair and uh and very few galleries in the fair it doesn't matter you still get the reflected luster of it, the bright light shines on our community. But this year it's been great because people still want Art Week here. We, we love it, we embrace it. It's, it's been 20 years. And um, what everybody's looking at is local art. And so that's a really nice moment for the artists here. And the gallerists figured it out, the museums figured it out, the alternative spaces like Locus Projects, uh, Dimensions Variable, they figured it out. So uh, it, it's a moment of self-reflection for us as a community where we step back and we say, you know, whether, whether we have the fair like we usually do or we don't, we really care about the visual arts community as a broader community. And so that's been really lovely and uh, a wonderful way to, uh, to remind ourselves that uh, the artists here are of a very high caliber and, and deserve consideration. The other thing I would say is that we are a community that does support our local artists uh, quite a bit. And we've watched them climb the, the art ladder and wind up in you know wonderful galleries and things like that. So it's a really nice week of self-reflection for us. Yeah, that sounds great. And, and Daniela, as with White Cube being an international gallery, how has this move toward more localization impacted you and your colleagues and what you do? That is a, a great question. And I was, when I was reviewing the answers for this, I really thought about that long and hard. Um, I think two things. I think it gave, it gives us an opportunity to think regionally. You know, where has an artist not been seen before? Um, where is there a community of people that have not had an opportunity to see the work of whoever. And if the artist is interested in engaging in a project there or engaging in, in could be anything from you know, an outdoor commission to an exhibition to maybe going and speaking in a panel, we're thinking more along those lines than just thinking sort of broadly, globally, internationally. So I think there could be opportunities for artists as well as, as the gallery to be more, um, yeah, to be more experimental, to be more strategic is where they, where they do projects. Um, I think also one thing I just want to mention about the silver lining of this is what I've enjoyed the most is people's responsiveness talking about artists, this continued way to figure out a way to connect people with the artists. And that's these amazing Zoom artist calls we've had. Um, and we've had several private, we've had several public, and as long as you maintain, you know, very high caliber, very high quality, it's a wonderful way to keep people, people connected um, to, to the artist and the artist's voice, which is the main thing that we're trying to, to communicate on all the time. And when you have these Zoom artist calls, Danielle, are those mm -hmm. mass kind of webinar things like we're doing right now, or are those more personal curated things Both. that you facilitate with your collectors? Okay. Both. We've had six, uh, which have been, I mean, some of them we've done with on the freeze and our Basel platforms. We've done them on our own platforms. Um, only two were private and they were sort of a preview for an exhibition. Um, but artists have surprisingly really enjoyed that. And I don't think it's something we would have ever proposed to an artist before. Um, but the ones that we did, they were like, yeah, that sounds really great. And, you know, we had an amazing cross section of people from museum directors to curators, to collectors, to other artists, to press. And it was an engaging, informative, exciting conversation. Um, and everyone seemed to enjoy it. So that's one thing I think we're hoping to sort of, to sort of continue. Now, Augustina, I, I think that this, I, I really did want to get into this idea of artists and how, what they're going through in this weird hybrid space that we're all occupying. Because I feel like, I mean, I used to work in a gallery back in the day and I didn't until that point really appreciate how much artists are often responding to like a physical space that they're going to put an exhibition in. And 
obviously in this period where they might be doing something online instead of something in a gallery, I have to imagine that changes the way that they think about what they're doing in their studio. So I'm, I'm curious to know if you've had any conversations with the artists that you work with that have really shed some light on this idea of like how they're thinking about things differently and maybe what you're doing differently in response to try to accommodate them and, and make all this work. I think that um, the, very, the first months of the pandemic were really uh, weird for all of us. Uh, and so in the beginning, it was kind of like we were all taking our time. First, we thought it was only going to last uh, maybe two weeks and it was going to be over. And then it became one month, two months. And most of the artists I work with have uh, actually gone all the way into like full production. Like it has been really good for their careers and their ideas because they have had the time to maybe think about their work and produce in a way that is not attached to deadlines necessarily. So I think it has given them more freedom. At the same time, I do have to say that uh, although I have done, uh, for example, recorder, su recorded Zoom conversations with between curators and artists and walkthroughs, and maybe I did an OVR for Liste Art Fair in Basel during the summer, and one of my, the artists I presented, I, we were presenting a solo and we were thinking about like in which way we could make it better. And we did a little video of that he uh, did in his studio. Uh, so it was his eyes on his work. And that was very interesting. Like he was making all the decisions. I think those kinds of things are interesting, but I also think that we don't have to demand this from artists. Like there is this very intense agenda now of like getting artists on Zoom calls, making them talk to collectors. And I personally don't align to that. I don't think all artists uh, are built that way. Some are more social and extroverts and others are just about their work. So one thing is for sure, artists want to work and they want to show their work. Uh, that is fundamental. How we do that, I think uh, in the same way Daniela was talking about how we present work to collectors, we have to be very careful. Not all of them speak the same language. For some, it's really hard to sit on a Zoom uh, and, and, and discuss things with people because they're socially awkward or they're anxious or they just want to work, you know? So I think we have to be very careful and go case by case, but as long as they keep working and, and we find ways to do it, I think a, a lot of good things can be done. And now as we start to, the city starts to, the city start to open again and we start to show uh, more, even if it's by appointment or whatever, I think uh, it's almost as normal as it was, you know, in that, in the sense of an exhibition program. Fairs are different, but in terms of shows, I think it's kind of, um, going back to what it was and what's important really, which is ex ex exhibitions. Right, right. And and uh, just Daniela, to, to go back to you really quickly about this idea of different artists maybe responding differently to different technologies. Like when you're choosing artists or, or asking artists to do these Zoom calls, um, are you how much are you factoring in that? Like, oh, I know them, like they present well in, in person normally, so they'll probably be good on a Zoom call. And, and like how much are you, I guess maybe a better question is how much are you trying to tailor what you do with artists to the technology that you have available now, whether it's Zoom calls or something else? I think first and foremost, we, we don't do random, well, you know, Zoom calls with artists. It's, it'll be around an exhibition um, or, a, or a project. Um, and so, um, you know, when we opened Georg Basel, it's in September. Um, he was, we said to him, because that was locked down, nobody would come. Um, would you be interested in, in, in being participating on a Zoom call? And he was like, yeah, that would be great. Um, before Tracy Emin opened her online exhibition, um, which was eight paintings just online, she was very happy to do an invitation sort of into her studio and talk about the painting. So 
it's really, it depends what the project is. We won't do it randomly. And if an artist is comfortable and they want to communicate and show the work, that's fantastic. If they don't, that's fine. We're very, very happy to do whatever an artist feels comfortable with um, and how they want the work mediated. And we will follow their lead on that. Um, so yeah, I think. Right, I mean, it's sort of a learning process for everyone, I feel like. Yeah, um, very much. Yeah, well, well I could, I, that raises an interesting question, which is, is there anything that any of you have encountered that you maybe thought was going to work at the beginning of all this, and then time has proven that, oh, actually, my thinking about that was entirely wrong, and actually the better way to do it is this. Dennis, I kind of saw you shaking your head there a second ago. Did, did, what, what's your standpoint on this? I, I want to make two points, one about what uh, my colleagues were saying, and that is that I don't want anybody to be confused at all about the tremendous impact what we're going through has had on the creativity of artists. Uh, I have a stable here of 18 artists in, in, at Ulite Arts, and um, it's been devastating. You know, Some of them have continued to work aggressively, but so many of them um, are either you know, struggling with what's going on emotionally, they're struggling with family issues, they're struggling with economic issues. Um, so yeah. I, you know, it, it, it's very important not to lose sight of the fact that, uh, that this is a really big deal for artists and the, the, the aura in which they work in has been disrupted in a profound way. And many, many, many of them have been having a tough time getting back to work. For some of them, it's because their medium doesn't allow them to go back to work. I happen to be a documentary filmmaker and uh, you know, I've shut down my films for six, seven months now because who's gonna sit for an interview? So some of them have been disrupted that way. Some of them are disrupted emotionally. It, it's very, very difficult to overstate what a big deal this has been to artists because that creativity is such a fragile gift and it's very hard to find. And when you do find it, you know, it's very hard to execute. That's why uh, the, the artists that we see, it, you know, at Art Basel in, in these best galleries in the world, like my, like my colleagues have, um, you, you know, that's a really small piece of the pyramid and it's very hard to get there. And this year is going to impact that uh, tremendously. The one thing I'm seeing, to, to come back to the second part of your question, Jim, the one thing I'm seeing right now is that, is that as restrictions begin to loosen and or people are simply getting bored of staying home, that what well, we were being very successful with Zoom events early in the pandemic, um, that audience is beginning to fall off dramatically. In the beginning of the pandemic, there was no sports to watch. You know, there was there were less. You, you know, you'd work your way through Netflix. You know, uh, those kind of things. But as of now, we're beginning to see the, the idea of Zoom events dissipate uh, in terms of audience willingness to engage. I would say dramatically, but it is happening literally on a monthly basis that people are less willing to take the time. Today being an exception, because we got hundreds and hundreds of people on here, but that's because of my colleagues. They're they're pretty big rock stars. So, but uh, but 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 it's really you know that's what I'm seeing is I'm seeing that you know particularly now we're talking vaccine and only you know four or five months away, people are really ready to get after it the old way again, and I I don't think you're going to see as much engagement for some of these things that we've had to invent or to bring to the fore in order to keep all of our programs going. I think, can I just comment on, on that? Please. Um, I think that, I think there's two levels and I think you're right. I think people just wanna be standing in front of works of art now, Dennis, 100%, and there's a real hunger, hence we're here. Um, but I do think we need to also think about the people that, you know, people in Indonesia who can't be here or people in you know, different parts of Europe or Africa. And I do think that provided it's not too much and, you know, and too often, I do think this hybrid, you know, um, but it is. Able to, yeah, but, but it will become, but you won't, ha you have the choice not to do it, but it's still like, we can reach, you know, we've never reached 161 countries before and we're getting, really positive responses and our mailing list has increased by 40% geographically. So I do think that it offers an opportunity for passionate art, you know, art collectors and passionate art viewers to be able to experience things. So if we can offer um, a, a scholarly, um, enjoyable, high quality 
experience, short of not being there, I think, well, it's something that White Cube is going to definitely try and continue to do because not everybody's going to be able to, you know, to physically engage with it. And so I do think it's just the, it's the adjustment of how those two sit side by side, I think, and we haven't quite gotten there yet. And, and, and Tim, just let, let me say one more thing about that, because because Danielle is right. One of the silver linings of this is that the way that we're operating right now has taken down the intimidation factor of the big white box gallery. Uh, it's taken it down, you know, fifty percent, sixty percent, seventy percent. You know, it was scary to walk into the into the big white box gallery and have the yes. person at the front desk down their nose at you and there's no price list and you walk around and nobody's, you know, you know, it's not like going shopping. And so this has been a real great opportunity for younger digital natives to engage with the art world in a completely different way. And that is what I think we're gonna take away from this in a positive way. You're gonna get a whole bunch of uh, 30 somethings, 40 somethings, even 20 somethings. They're called millennials, millennials. Millennials are way, way younger. <laughs> Younger. I have a, I, I work for millennials here. I have like 15 of them, but, but you're going to get that group that may not have had uh, the willingness to engage or felt uncomfortable about the engagement process, even at an art fair. Uh, you know, so I think that is going to be the silver lining is you're going to get the next body of collectors may have been built during the pandemic. I agree with you on that. And that's something we're looking at in terms of behavior, age brackets and, and definitely the millennials, which there's some fantastic statistics that, you know, they buy 80% of what they do, they do online, they need that immediate sort of engagement online. And I think in 2030, you know, their net worth is going to exceed $4 trillion. So this platform allows galleries like ours, Augustina, to, to foster interest in the language and in a way that they like to communicate and engage. Yeah. So good I point, mean, Dennis. Thank you. I mean, it's no doubt something that uh, has stressed. It's not necessarily related to the pandemic, but most of the business that I conduct with collectors that are uh, younger than below 50, let's say, um, it's through WhatsApp and Instagram. So it's definitely, uh, in that sense, it is very important. Um, what, but the question was what we were going to do different and what did we try that didn't work? Well, we, we have sort of uh, organically slid into what was gonna be yeah. my last question, <laughs> which is like, okay. what, what, do we, what can we take away from, from what we've gone through that might apply to the future? So it's probably better for you if you just go to that. Uh, well, like I said, I think we have to really consider and and sort of program digital content as much as we program our physical spaces. That is something that's very important for me. I had never done any online exhibitions and I only did once one this year, but it was such an amazing show. I brought together not only artists, but writers, chefs, musicians, and, and, and organized um, an exhibition around the ideas of time and food. And it turned out to be a wonderful thing, uh, all sorts of collaborations. And I think, for example, for me, that's, that's, it's here to stay. Like, why not? Online exhibitions are so wonderful and fun and, and they reach so much people. And then uh, what's here to stay? I hope empathy and camaraderie and, and openness and just, I think the art world shouldn't go back to what it was. Why would we? Um, let's go somewhere that's better. A place where we don't judge galleries be, uh, only based on how much they sell and who to. And, you know, this, I think there's something very positive that changed. And it's like, we all want, uh, I don't want to sound too romantic, although I am a little, I mean, we have to hang on to some hope and, 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 and nice ideas. Um, but I do think we need to think of an art world that is more collaborative in general, more resomatic, and not just by international traveling and a, a commercial globality, but an actual camaraderie. And I think uh, we have started to see that. And that's what I would like to take. Uh, that is already happening in my generation since forever. Um, but I have now seen happen with other generations of uh, 
of dealers, uh, people who came before me. And I think that's, that has been wonderful. That's my take. Oh, I think that that's, that's beautifully said. And I mean, the romanticization aspect is important <laughs> because like, if we didn't all, I, I just fundamentally believe that, that people who are in creative fields are inherently romantics and that's a good thing because if we didn't have some kind of hope for the future, if we didn't make that this, if we didn't believe that this thing we're doing could make the world better in some sense, like we'd all work in a bank. It, it yeah. just wouldn't be, we wouldn't be doing this. Are we going to offer so I, now like some kind of like Coca-Cola song or something? This is really- <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope not, yeah. We, <laughs> uh, no, do you want to start Dennis? Dreaming. I'll try to join in if I can. Yeah. I dreaming it, one. dreaming, dreaming it is a way of planning it too, thinking about it. Right. It's a way of planning it too, kind of putting that intention forward. I, I do want to say that, you know, uh, makers are going to make, uh, gallerists are going to show, and collectors are going to collect. That's not going to change. I bought during this last six months, I bought 30 works of art. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it, that's about what I've averaged for the last 40 years. Uh, it, if you're a collector, if you have the collecting gene, if you have a collecting Jones, as I like to say, um, you're just going to keep doing it. You're going to find a way to do it. Uh, you know, the one thing we didn't get to talk about, and that could be another panel, uh, is, is, is what's happened with price points online. You know, we all used to be willing to buy something online for a couple grand. I found myself bidding last week on something for mid six figures online that I hadn't seen. That's another big shift that's come out of this is that is that where we're willing to enter in an online uh, re relationship with a piece of art has changed dramatically. It's it, it's that's the future. That's that's what's happened. Uh, and the auction houses are as a good example. You know, they've got too many auctions now. They haven't figured out a way to strike to strike a good balance. That's another place where, you know, the tsunami just kind of falls on you. But uh, everybody's going to keep making everybody's going to keep showing and we're all going to be out here for you collecting. So that's the most important thing. We haven't somehow lost that, that emphasis. Um, and I think that that's the, uh, that that's, that's the future. Yeah. So we have, we've already sort of started to cover some of the questions that are coming in the Q and a, which I feel like is a, a good thing. Uh, so I'm going to start to shift more over in that direction now, now with the, the last few minutes that we have. So one thing that people are asking about is this idea of finding new artists in this time and how that has changed given the restrictions that, that we're going through. So that's probably more of a question for Daniela and Agustina, but um, do you have any insights on how you're looking differently at emerging talent? Um, no, I think I'm going about it the same way. The only thing that could be different is how I reach out to them, because usually you would get on a plane and schedule or schedule a studio visit for uh, a time in, in, that you will be in town because of a fair, like things like that. Um, and now maybe it's more through, yes, like a Zoom uh, or the FaceTime studio visit. But it's not like the world is over. So eventually you will get to see them. I mean, I do think it's important, the physicality, like we don't, I, I, I don't want to feel we are going to give up on the physical art world. No, please don't, but <laughs> let's not. But um, finding artists, uh, I think I'm going about it pretty much the same way. I don't know about you, Daniela. Yeah, no, I totally agree. It hasn't really changed much. The only thing is you can't go and be in the studio if they're not in the same city as you. Um, but that will change very, very soon. I mean, I, was, I got on a plane to come here. I took a test. They let me on the plane and it was yeah. fine. So I think, I think that's going to change quite shortly. If anything, perhaps we have more time to really research artists. Um, because we're not on jumping on a plane here, there and everywhere all the time. So we can read and we can really learn and we can inform ourselves and have conversations with other artists who are looking at other artists and hear what they're looking at. So it's probably a more fruitful time. Um, and then as Agostina says, as soon as you can get in a plane and get in the studio, then, then that's great. But we've done some fantastic sort of studio visits on Zoom with the artists. We've either, we've also done 
uh, Zoom calls with artists in their studio with curators who are working on upcoming shows who hadn't had weren't able to go to the studio yet. And, and that seemed to work. So probably more time to bring in artists in, in a more meaningful way. That's interesting. Now, another question that came up in the Q&A is about, like we've talked a lot about Zoom, we've talked about online viewing rooms, but people want to know how social media has factored into your strategy during this time. And Dennis, maybe I'll start with you just because I'm curious to know what your social media diet has been as a collector. Yeah, well, I, I actually, my social media feed, the one I put out to the world was named one of the top 50 collector uh, feeds in the world by one of these uh, you know, places that keep track of collectors and all that. So I enjoy doing it to pushing it out. I have to say that I don't, um, I don't see much art on Instagram that develops into something other than zoom, you know, flicking my finger to the next thing. Um, so Instagram for me uh, is is more of an output as opposed to an intake. Um, whereas all the things we talked about today, online viewing rooms, the auction houses, uh, uh, you know, JPEGs from a personal email from a dealer, that continues to be my diet of of intake. You know, that's where I'm, I'm seeing things. And the other thing is I've always listened to other artists and I continue to listen to other artists about other artists. And I continue to maintain my dialogue with curators. Uh, you know, curators are the best kept secret in the art world in terms of how valuable they can be to a, to a collector. And all you do is, you know, help them with a show or help them with a catalog or something like that and access to those curators. And I've, I've had that for many, many years they really know what's coming. And so, um, so I haven't changed who I'm talking to. I've simply changed the inputs that I'm taking. Um, uh, and it's these online viewing rooms, the auction houses and uh, direct contacts, which here's my show. I've also taken the time because I'm in the middle of basically shifting the collection again for the fifth time. And Deborah and I are only gonna work on works on paper for the next 10 years. And we've been busy at that for, for the last couple of years as we shifted away from this big uh, Aboriginal Australian contemporary art project we were doing. And I've taken this time to make sure that the gallerists that, that, that know me know that that's what we're looking at now. And that's all we're looking at because it really helps as a collector if the gallerists know what, what you're into, you know, whether you like blue things or drawings or it really doesn't matter what it is. It's just that they have a little you know, a little notebook and they say, ah, Dennis likes, you know, drawings. And when they get something great, you know, you get contacted early and the fight for material hasn't changed. You're still fighting for the good stuff all the time. You know, there's not a, people don't think this is true, but there is clearly, particularly the blossoming of the number of collectors in the world. There's never enough good stuff to go around. Right. Right. And especially for now in this, this stage where more things are more accessible to more people through more mediums and in yeah. theory that might just increase yeah. the, the puts a lot of, of pressure on the gallerist too because yeah. that's the other thing that hasn't changed they want that work to go someplace special and and right. special in the international art world means a good collection somebody who's not a flipper somebody whose long-term intent is to give it to a museum etc cetera, etc cetera. that pressure hasn't changed a bit you know it really hasn't right right um I guess, you know, just because you mentioned before that uh, phone calls have not been your thing traditionally, um, how has the social media aspect changed for you? It really hasn't. Um, I think, uh, especially for my generation, um, and when you have a smaller gallery, your social media presence is very important. And also a personal social media account comes also into play, even if it's private or whatever. So social media for us is it's a, just another language we speak. It's we're all, most of us uh, are natives. Um, and so it's something that we do and you do get to see through the statistics, which is interesting, who follows you, their age group, uh, their location, everything. You can pull all this information that is really useful. Having said that, I don't like to overanalyze my social media. Uh, I mean, I know it's there, I know it's a tool, I use it, I promote my artists, but I don't live through Instagram. 
Uh, I'm starting to wean off a little. I have set all my timers. It's just, it's too consuming. Um, and I would rather focus on other things, but it is tremendously important. Uh, uh, although I have to say a lot of, for example, live streamings and stuff, it has gone, gone down a little bit. Like uh, Dennis was mentioning, like all the Zoom engagement. Uh, so we, I don't feel very comfortable like over bombarding people with stories. And, you know, I just post what I think it's enough and necessary to, I also have like an, an Instagram issue right now. I haven't been able to update my bio and there's some sort of glitch and you can't talk to any human on Instagram. So my bio, for example, my gallery is showing like an older show that I closed in January and I'm like so frustrated. It's like, you know, uh, it's still technology. It's not the real thing. It's a great way to promote the program, but there's also other efforts that one has to do and focus on, but it's undoubtedly a major tool to just sell yeah. too. Right, 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 right. And I think it's, it's just a case study in the fact that this is something that we're all still learning and adapting to as we go. And I think that that's gonna continue to be the case in the months and maybe the years going forward, though hopefully COVID will not be here for too many more of those. <laughs> hey, Daniela, one of the, uh, one of the questions was, uh, is there a reason why you're not active on social media? <laughs> oh, me personally? <laughs> because, because White Cube does it better. <laughs> Sorry, I have, I, have to, I, have to, I have no. to hire, I have to hire my son to help me do that. No, I just, uh, yeah, no, White Cube does it better. And so, yeah, but nice question. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let the experts handle it if you can. Um, we are going to have to leave it there. Thanks to everyone who joined us. Thanks to everyone who asked questions. And we hope that you will be able to join us for some of the other panels that are taking place in the Art Basel Miami Beach OVR conversation series this weekend. You we have, for example, artists working with museums today, which is tomorrow. And Thinking Globally, Selling Locally, which you can find on Sunday. You can register for all these at artbasel.com. And that's what we have for you. Thanks again to our terrific panelists for being with us. Thank you. And stay safe, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank Goodbye. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.